Everybody, it's the weekend interview show. I'm Scott Horton, your host. Welcome. It's the Republic Broadcasting Network, and I uh, should have a really good show lined up for you. Uh, here in a few minutes, we're going to be talking to James Bamford, the author of A Pretext for War. And um, the way it's going to work on this show, folks, is uh, foreign policy first. And uh, the reason that I want to put foreign policy first is because I don't think that this uh, massive Leviathan police state that we're creating in the United States can possibly be reversed until we end the state of warfare overseas. Uh, years ago, someone asked me, oh, come on, they want to take all our freedom away. How could they ever take all our freedom away? Uh, we'd never stand for it. We're Americans. And I said, well, all they have to do is give us a foreign enemy, and uh, we will be willing to give up our liberty. He said I was crazy, and, of course, you know, turn it to uh, C-SPAN right now. You'll see that I turns out I was correct. So... As long as we're at war, we can't get rid of the Department of Homeland Security. We can't repeal the Patriot Act. Uh, we can't repeal the pieces of the Patriot Act, too, that have already been passed. We're not really going to be able to uh, get our uh, country set back on the right path until we end the, our policy of perpetual war for perpetual peace. And so that's why I put foreign policy first on this show. And uh, that's why I have as our uh, guest today, James Banford. Probably most of you are familiar with him. Uh, he's the uh, former Washington investigative producer for World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, and he's the author of the books The Puzzle Palace and Body of Secrets about the National Security Agency, and uh, his new book is called A Pretext for War. Uh, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thanks very much. It's an honor to have you on. Well, I appreciate being here. Okay, well, um, we only have a couple of minutes before our first little break here, so uh, I think we'll just start out with you know, the basic question, I think, that most media don't even try to really answer, um, but you pretty much come right out and, and answer this question in your book. Uh, the question is, why do they hate us, these terrorists that we're fighting? Well, if you uh, read uh, most of the things that have been written by the terrorists or said by Osama bin Laden or uh, read his fatwas or whatever, the primary reason for the uh, hatred, in the uh, particularly in the Middle East, uh, the, the most common common denominator is the fact the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, presence in the Middle East and the fact that uh, we've um, uh, supported uh, um, some of the worst dictators in the Middle East and uh, back to Israel and their occupation of uh, Palestine, back it with uh, billions of dollars as well as the, um, the helicopters, the ammunition, and the political support. Those are the principal reasons they want the United States to uh, uh, basically um, uh, get out of uh, the Middle East, stop supporting the, uh, the worst dictators of the Middle East, and to uh, leave the um, uh, Palestine uh, issue with Israel to be uh, negotiated as opposed to supported. I read something, I think just in the last week, where they were quoting Osama bin Laden as talking about all the terrible things America has done to us for the last 80 years. And I thought, 80 years? Hang on. And I started counting on my fingers, and I thought, oh, he's talking about the end of World War One. He's going back that far. Well, I think he's going back to the Balfour Declaration, um, which was uh, the declaration that uh, the British government signed in, I think it was 1918 or 1917, um, uh, which basically um, made Palestine a, um, a, uh, a homeland for, for the Jews. Uh, uh, that was part of what the Balfour Declaration was, and uh, the British supported that, and I think that's where a lot of the, um, that's where, if they say back 80 years, I think that's where they're taking it. All right, our guest is James Bamford. It's the Weekend Interview Show. Stay tuned. All 
right, everybody. Welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm your host, Scott Horton, and on the phone is James Bamford, who's the author of A Pretext for War. And uh, it's an excellent book. It goes into, uh, it's got a few different sections. It goes into the inti- inside story of the U.S. intelligence agencies and what they knew and what they weren't telling each other uh, during the time leading up to the attack. It tells uh, in-depth stories, including from people who were on the planes and in the towers of the attacks of September 11th. It has a pretty in-depth history of the Al-Qaeda network and uh, the ties between the different terrorists. And also, uh, the most important part, I think, is actually um, where the title comes from, about how a small group of intellectual neoconservatives took this country to war in Iraq. And uh, hopefully, toward the end of the interview, we'll get to that part. I'd like to ask you, sir, about Ramzi Youssef and the, the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993. Now, he's the nephew of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, is that right? That's right, yeah. And now, were they already tied with Osama bin Laden and the Al-Qaeda network at this point, or they just kind of did that on their own? No, not in 1993. Uh, they had, I don't think they had really uh, much connection. They may have met him in uh, Afghanistan <clears throat> around that time, but it was there was no um, organized Al-Qaeda connection that they were involved in at that time. Well, the conventional wisdom is that these are religious fundamentalist extremist types uh, who are out to get us, but Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi Youssef, they don't really strike me as the uh, fundamentalist, uh, pious, pray ten times a day kind of guys. Well, they weren't. They, um, matter of fact, uh, when after the bombing uh, of the uh, World Trade Center the first time, uh, both of them went to the Philippines where they uh, began helping one of the Philippine um uh, terrorist organizations, and during that time, uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, uh, basically became a womanizer. He wore a white tuxedo, went to some of the fancy nightclubs, and dated a lot of women uh, down in um, uh, the Philippines. So uh, he's never been a uh, uh, sort of a religious fanatic or uh, tied to uh, tied real closely to any uh, uh, particular religious. Uh, uh, dogma. It was mostly uh, hatred of America for its foreign policy as opposed to any religious uh, reasons. There's a story in your book. You talk about a massacre at the Kwana refugee camp uh, by Israel, a refugee camp in Lebanon, I believe. And I've never even heard of this story before, and yet in your book you say this is really pivotal to the formation of al-Qaeda. Uh, yeah, there was a, it was a very uh, large attack by Israel on uh, a number of um, installations uh, um, in um, southern Lebanon, and um, it made a large impression, actually, upon a lot of people. It was front-page news in the um, European press, uh, the uh, uh, British press, European press, and uh, one of the people who, I think, won uh, one of the major journalism awards for his reporting on that uh, was... um, uh, uh, Fisk, I forgot his first name. Oh, Robert Fisk, Robert Fisk at the Independent. Uh, who, who writes for the Independent, and uh, he uh, he described the battle because he was there and uh, described the massacre, and it was uh, extremely bloody and uh, very one-sided, and and um, that angered enormous numbers of Muslims, Arabs uh, in the Middle East uh, because it was extremely heavily covered there. Um, Israel shot a missile at a ambulance and a number of other things like that. So um, Bin Laden, if you read his fatwas and his statements uh, um, uh, around that period of time and from then on, uh, he frequently mentions uh, Kwana at the, uh, during those times. So it was a very um, uh, inflaming incident in terms of his his own uh, uh, development of his hatred for the United States and as well for other people throughout the Middle East. And what year was that? Uh, that was, I think it was in 1996. Okay, so this is actually, this takes place after the Bojinka plot in the Philippines of Ramzi Youssef and Abdul Hakim Murad. That's right, yeah, they, they were really uh, unconnected uh, um, in terms of the, those two plots were unconnected. They, uh, the connection was that Bin Laden was living in the Sudan, and he um, uh, wanted to go back to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia denied him permission to come back, and the U.S. was putting pressure on on uh, the Sudan to get rid of Bin Laden. And and 
due to all the pressure, Bin Laden decided to leave and go to um, uh, Afghanistan. And it was around that time that the uh, uh, actually he stopped, I think, in in um, got her at the time uh, on the way to Afghanistan. It was right around that time. I think it was April of '96 that it took place, and that was a major factor in, in Bin Laden's thinking, and he's, uh, he mentioned it numerous times uh, as one of the causes for his hatred of the United States, United States support for Israel and Israel's invasion at that time. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Karen Katowski made a comment one time about how the Wahhabist, uh, fundamentalist, extremist uh, Sunnis in the Middle East, that they're sort of the neoconservatives of the Middle East, that is, Nobody listens to them until all hell breaks loose. And once things are on fire and people are being blown apart, all of a sudden people are more willing to uh, listen to what the Wahhabis have to say. Uh, not unlike uh, we're willing to listen to Paul Wolfowitz after some towers fall down in our country. Well, in the sense that they're both extreme, uh, hold extremist views, I think that's true. I think they're sort of uh, opposites in terms of their um, uh, Philosophy, but in in a sense they're, they're both fundamentalist and um, and hold these views which are um, far from the mainstream. Uh, the problem is uh, um, in the United States the these people who held these views, the neoconservatives, were put in, in a position of uh, great power and great authority, and that's one of the reasons we were in the Iraq War right now. On page 210 in your book, you say, In the end, the only winner was Osama bin Laden. All along, his goal and that of his top leadership was to draw the United States deeper and deeper into the sinkhole of a war in the Middle East. Aman al-Zawahiri, bin Laden's close associate and confidant, argued that al-Qaeda should bring the war to the distant enemy in order to provoke the Americans to strike back and personally wage the battle against the Muslims. So... It's not that they're really trying to get us to leave the Middle East. It's that they're trying to suck us in. No, they want us out of the Middle East, but the, uh, uh, they believe that the uh, United States has already declared war on them in the Middle East, and uh, uh, they've been doing it remotely from the United States with money and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 political support for uh, leaders of Saudi Arabia and other places, as well as uh, positioning. U.S. Uh, military over there, and what uh, obviously that they wanted from, if you read the, their comments, uh, Zawahiri and uh, Bin Laden and so forth, uh, was to have an actual war um, uh, against them. They, they're, you know, a handful of people can't have a war against the United States, and what they were hoping for was uh, to provoke a war um, between the United States and many of the uh, people in, in the Middle East, and um, if you're attacking the United States and you blow up a few buildings, attack uh, uh, a ship or the embassies and so forth, um, um, you're not really affecting the United States uh, as a whole. But if you get the United, provoke the United States into into a war, such as in Vietnam, where the United States ended up uh, basically losing that war and then leaving uh, in disgrace. Um, which is largely what happened. The United States uh, basically just gave up after we lost 50,000 people over there. Um, I think that was more, I think that's more, if you read the writings and the, the statements, it's more what they wanted than just simply blowing up a few things. They wanted to provoke a war in which the United States would ultimately be defeated as, uh, as in Vietnam. And that's, uh, if that was their goal, uh, they're probably very happy about what, what the turnout has been so far. Well, uh, Mike Schurer, the anonymous CIA agent, who I guess is not so anonymous, uh, who wrote the book Imperial Hubris, he was quoted recently as saying that the Iraq invasion is a gift to al-Qaeda. Do you agree with that? Well, I agree mostly with what he... he, he uh, there's sort of two points he makes. Uh, I agree with his first point, which is very similar to the issues I've just been saying, which is that... Um, uh, the reasons for the hatred and the and the uh, um, probably the satisfaction that they have in, the, in, in generating the United States to uh, get involved in this quagmire over there. I think uh, I agree with what he's with what he says, which is similar to what I've been saying. 
uh, I don't agree with his other with his other point, which is pretty much that the solution is to kill as many uh, kill as many of them as possible. Uh, I think there's other ways of doing this, short of that. But um, but in terms of the reason that they hate us and the reason we're involved in this, I do agree with that. Well, and I think he qualified. I, I know that the uh, NBC cut of his interview uh, would leave one to believe that, but from what I've been able to tell, he seems to be saying that, look, either we can stop meddling in the Middle East or we can start killing as many of these guys as we can, but we can't have neither. It's got to be one or the other. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, right, and I agree with the first point, that uh, we should stop meddling in the Middle East. It's easier, like, you, you can have the United States... Uh, uh, be a superpower, play a major role in the world, um, without micromanaging every uh, aspect of what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, for example, if, um, yeah, it might be advantageous for the United States to have had a uh, had a presence in the Middle East in case there was an attack. So, both, you know, if if you're if you want to have the United States have a presence in the Middle East, there was an easier way of doing it than facing all these uh, military people in Saudi Arabia, which obviously was a trigger point. You could have simply put them on two aircraft carriers in the Indian Ocean and never bothered anybody. The Cold War was over. We had aircraft carriers to spare, and you could have put them on there, and nobody would have been offended. All right. The guest is James Bamford. The book is A Pretext for War. It's the weekend interview show. We'll be right back. Everybody, welcome back to the weekend interview show. I'm Scott Horton, and our guest today is James Bamford. He's the author of The Puzzle Palace, Body of Secrets, and his latest, A Pretext for War. Now, uh, sir, right before the break, you were saying that we could have had our, you know, if we really wanted to have a military presence in the Middle East, we could have just kept them on uh, aircraft carriers out in the middle of the ocean. But that basing our troops in Saudi Arabia between the two Iraq wars, that, that was a major trigger for Al Qaeda. Is that right? Well, it, that, that's right, and it was obvious from the statements that were made by many of the people in the Middle East that they didn't like uh, uh, the fact that the U.S. was um, uh, had a presence in, in the holiest of uh, places for the Muslim world. And um, the U.S. could have easily had a presence in the Middle East if we had put the people on, uh, if we just based two aircraft carriers in the Indian Ocean, and uh, we also had a base uh, not that far away on uh, Diego Garcia, which was a British, um, an island uh, in the Indian Ocean that was owned by Britain that was leased to the United States for uh, uh, military uses. So we had a lot of areas there where we could have had a, a presence without um, either offending uh, a lot of uh, Arab sensibilities and also without... Uh, uh, seeming to support the, um, the Saudi uh, Saudi royal family. Well, it's come out from uh, Paul O'Neill, the former Secretary of Treasury, and Richard Clark, the former Director of Counterterrorism, that the Bush administration wanted a war against Iraq all along, from the moment they took power, and that immediately, uh, even on the day of September 11th and the next day, plans were already being laid for attacking Iraq. Uh, why do you think that is? What what exactly is motivating that? Well, there's two uh, factors, I think. The, the first one is that the people who were the architects of the war, who basically were the uh, people who occupied uh, the senior positions at the Pentagon and in uh, Vice President Cheney's office, um, had uh, uh, been planning for this war for years. Uh, at least since 1996, there was a... Uh, um, Three of the members of that group, uh, Richard Pearl, uh, Douglas Fife, and uh, Dave, uh, David uh, Wumser, uh, drafted a plan for Israel in 1996 um, to overthrow Saddam Hussein and re replace him with a uh, basically a puppet who was friendly to both Israel and the United States. And this is a clean break, a new strategy for securing the realm that they wrote for Benjamin Netanyahu, actually, right? 
That's right. This was in 1996, and they were working as consultants for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who had uh, recently been elected as Prime Minister of Israel, and uh, Pearl Wumser and Fife uh, were part of a small group who drafted this uh, plan called, uh, which they named uh, a clean break, and part of that plan involved uh, uh, overthrowing the Saddam government and replacing Saddam Hussein with, uh, like I said, a puppet friendly to the United States and Israel, who the person they had in mind, obviously, was uh, uh, Ahmed Chalabi, who had been a friend of uh, theirs, a friend of the neocons for a very long time. And now it turns out was working for Iran. Uh, if the allegations are true, uh, he, 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 yeah, apparently was uh, giving some very valuable secrets to the Iranian government, uh, and uh, if this was the United. If he was in the United States, he would have been arrested for espionage at that point. But um, so they came up with a plan, and, and Richard Pearl basically, uh, not basically, he did hand deliver the uh, the plan to Netanyahu. Uh, Netanyahu wisely uh, uh, put it in the bottom drawer and never looked at it again. Uh, they never acted upon the uh, the plan, uh, but it was still active in the minds of Wumser, uh, Pearl, and, and Fife. And when they took office as senior officials in the Bush administration, um, they basically brought it to life. One of those people, David Wumser, actually wrote a paper in January of 2001. Uh, which he um, advocated the United States and Israel jointly launching a Middle East war. And one of the lines in that uh, document that he wrote at the time, he was at the American Enterprise Institute, um, said, uh, crises are opportunities. And uh, apparently they uh, they used uh, 911 as that crisis for an opportunity, the opportunity being to enact what in essence was the clean break plan. Um, so on the very day of uh, September 11th, uh, you have um, Secretary of Defense uh, Rumsfeld actually saying, as one of his aides wrote down notes where he was saying, uh, um, how, you know, basically uh, expand this to bring in Saddam Hussein, even though all the evidence was pointing to um, uh, Osama bin Laden. Right, things related and not sweep it all up. That's right, right yeah. And by sweep it up, he means shatter everything into a million pieces. Well, sweep sweep it all up. and uh, In other words, uh, expand it beyond just uh, Osama bin Laden and, and al-Qaeda to, to everybody they don't like in the Middle East, uh, beginning with uh, Saddam Hussein, even though there was no evidence that Saddam Hussein had any connection with uh, September 11th. He wanted to sweep him up along with uh, uh, al-Qaeda and bin Laden and, and uh, any retaliation that came out of September 11th. All right. It's the Weekend Interview Show. Our guest is James Bamford, and it's the Republic Broadcasting Network. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton, and my guest today is author James Bamford. He wrote the book, A Pretext for War. And uh, <clears throat> before the break started there, sir, you were talking about how Iraq had nothing to do with the attack of September 11th and how, despite that fact, the highest levels of the administration were already uh, kicking into gear and working out an excuse to attack them. And uh, which brings up, you, you said the American Enterprise Institute there a second ago. I wonder, what do you think of the theories of uh, Lori Milroy and um, her book, Saddam Hussein's Unfinished War with the United States, and all the accusations about Ramzi Youssef and uh, others associated being actually tied to the Saddam Hussein regime? Well, it's just basically crackpot journalism. Um, uh, crazy right-wing um, uh, conspiracy theories and... Uh, uh, the problem is you have crazy right-wing uh, neoconservatives in office, so they're going to believe the um, uh, all, all the 
crazy right-wing uh, neoconservative conspiracy theories. And um, she's the author of uh, a lot of those uh, theories, and uh, the people in the administration have sort of uh, lashed upon uh, a lot of those. Um, so um, It's funny because, you know, a lot of right-wing conspiracy theories nowadays are about her and about the American Enterprise Institute. Well, um, you, from the other angle. Right, exactly, yeah. And uh, I think they, back during the Reagan administration, um, uh, Claire Sterling wrote a book that uh, uh, tried to show a Soviet connection to the um, assassination of the Pope and so forth, and that was lashed, lashed upon by a lot of the uh, conservatives and neoconservatives back then. I think the um, um, that's the same way that's, that's happening now. I think there was a, um, a big effort to, to try to show that there was a connection between Ramsey Yusuf um, and the... Uh, and Saddam Hussein and the First World Trade Center attack, and there's never been any evidence from any uh, source that shows that there was that connection, and al almost every investigation that's ever looked into that uh, has said that there's no connection, but still, that's one of the tenets of this, uh, this conspiracy theory. Another motive that you identify in your book is the alleged assassination attempt against George Bush Sr. and Laura Bush, in Kuwait in 1993, and uh, I believe you quote our uh, chief executive as saying, he tried to kill my daddy as one of the reasons for the uh, war against Iraq. Is that right? Yeah, he's uh, said uh, either that or similar comments a number of times uh, over the years, um, showing his uh, great animosity towards Saddam Hussein, which is really understandable. The problem is... Um, whatever your personal views are, you shouldn't act out upon them as President of the United States. Well, um, and, and that assassination attempt was all bunk anyway. That wasn't even true, was it? Yeah, but it, I didn't really get into that. Seymour Hersh has written a lot about that. For, the, for my purposes, it doesn't really make any difference. It's, what's, it's what George W. Bush believed, uh, and he believed the, um, uh, the information to be true, and, and that's what really counts. Uh, whether it was true or not is almost beside the point. It's what George W. Bush believed. And uh, w what he believed was basically what was told to him by the uh, the Justice Department. And the Justice Department, in their report, indicated that it wasn't just uh, his father that, that would have been killed. It would have been virtually his entire immediate family, his father, his mother, his wife, his two brothers and their wives, uh, or two of his brothers and, and their wives. And... Um, that's because they were all traveling together, and they all would have been on the stage uh, uh, together when the, the bomb would have gone off. So um, you have George W. Bush, who uh, looks at Saddam Hussein as not only being um, a sort of a, a, a leftover uh, problem uh, from his father's uh, previous administration, he's also somebody who tried to kill all his immediate family. So. Uh, going into office, he uh, he had this enormous amount of animosity, which he um, vocalized a number of times. So you, you combine that with the uh, uh, the neoconservative, uh, anti-Saddam, uh, anti-Iraq uh, um, involvement in prior years, uh, getting together at that first National Security Council meeting on January 30th, 2001. And uh, what you end up having is the only two topics of conversation during that uh, National Security Council meeting was, number one, um, um, uh, going easier on Israel, um, uh, becoming more friendly towards um, Ariel Sharon, uh, and uh, at the same time um, finding ways to um, go about attacking Iraq. Well, just for the record, I've actually interviewed Frederick Whitehurst, the former director of the FBI crime lab, and he said that they lied about the explosive. He determined what kind of explosive it was in that so-called assassination attempt, and they came out and said it was an entirely different kind of explosive so they could pretend to match it from something from Iraq or match it to something from Iraq, just for the record. Was, right, yeah, know. no, I, uh, and I uh, touch on those uh, some of those aspects in the book, but the you know, for, for the point of why we went to war with Iraq, it, it's what what was in George W. Bush's mind, not what the reality was, which is often the case. Right. 
Uh, you also write in your book, I thought this was an interesting point, uh, and, and I think it also illustrates the split between the uh, mainline American foreign policy establishment and the neoconservatives. Uh, you write in your book about how uh, many considered Saddam Hussein a stabilizing force in the region. He was not uh, a threat that was about to, uh, you know, destroy all peace and security in the area. He was actually uh, a stabilizing force. In fact, I think I remember 1997, Fareed Zachariah, who I think is on this week with uh, George Stephanopoulos nowadays. And he writes a column for Newsweek. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Fareed Zachariah said, uh, in fact, I think it was in Newsweek, uh, that if Saddam Hussein did not exist, we would have to invent him. He is the linchpin of our foreign policy in the Middle East. Well, the, the uh, prior Reagan and Bush administration certainly thought, thought, thought so. We, we not only uh, gave him moral support, we gave him intelligence uh, support, and um, uh, including the precursors of uh, biological weapons, which uh, uh, we end up, ended up using as one of the reasons for launching the war in Iraq, uh, that all that friendship and cooperation, intelligence, and germ warfare was given to them, or at least the precursors, the germs, were given to them during the Reagan and uh, early Bush administration. So, um, in addition, yeah, he was a stabilizing force, the same way Tito was a stabilizing force in Yugoslavia, holding these di uh, divergent uh, ethnic groups together into, in a sort of a cohesive whole. Um, and uh, Saddam Hussein... Uh, uh, was holding the the three um, groups, the uh, Sunnis, the uh, uh, Shiites, and the, and the Kurds together. Um, so uh, he was a despicable leader, um, which the United States supported during the early Bush and uh, Reagan administration. Um, but he was a, um, a threat internally to his own people, like a lot of other dictators around the world, but he certainly was not a threat to the United States. Uh, during the nine, uh, after the UN, uh, after the Gulf War, uh, in the early 90s, the uh, UN went in and destroyed virtually all of the uh, weapons of mass destruction that he had, and, and Saddam Hussein turned instead to constructing palaces of mass luxury as opposed to weapons of mass destruction. And, and that's what a lot of people in the intelligence community were, were saying prior to the um, invasion. Well, and that really brings up... The, uh, the Office of Special Plans and the, the Pentagon and the neoconservatives, their own little intelligence agency that they created because, like you're saying, the conclusion of the mainline intelligence agencies was there's nothing there, right? Yes, that's right. And I uh, uh, interviewed a number of people at the intelligence agencies. Uh, actually, prior to the war, I wrote three op-ed pieces in August, September, and October uh, saying the people I've interviewed said, you don't see any evidence of uh, weapons of mass destruction over there. Um, and uh, the whole idea was that you would uh, send the inspectors over there. The inspectors would uh, do their job, and when they, were con when they concluded their job, they would either say that they found evidence or they didn't find evidence. And the problem was the Bush administration it wasn't Saddam who threw the, threw the uh, weapons inspectors out. It was uh, Bush who threw the weapons inspectors out. Uh, before they completed their job. Um, and uh, so th the problem was the White House um, wanted to go to war. The Pentagon wanted to go to war. Uh, the CIA wasn't being, being very cooperative because they weren't coming up with the hard evidence showing that these, uh, uh, number one, that CIA wasn't showing evidence that there were weapons of mass destruction over there, and number two, uh, they weren't showing any links between uh, Saddam and, and um, Al-Qaeda, uh, so that's why the Pentagon set up their own special little ad hoc, <clears throat> excuse me, ad hoc uh, intelligence uh, unit. Um, and that was run by uh, this guy, David Wumser, who again was one of the principal architects of the um, uh, uh, Clean Break Report in 1996 uh, given to Israel. So uh, Wumser... Uh, set up this little unit in the Pentagon to cherry-pick intelligence. In other words, uh, you get a report in with uh, ten pieces of evidence indicating there aren't weapons of mass destruction and one little piece indicating there might be. He'd ignore all the uh, he'd ignine, ignore the nine other pieces and take the, the one little questionable piece and add that together with lots of other questionable pieces 
and uh, give distorted uh, uh, intelligence, and that's basically what happened. So uh, they were they were pumped the while well, the CIA uh, at least initially was pumping out uh, correct intelligence. Um, it was this little unit in the Pentagon that was pumping out all this distorted intelligence, and that was what they were using to go on. And you say in your book, and this is something that, as far as I can tell, and I've studied this as much as I can, the only places I can find this is in your book, in one article in The Guardian, and something written for, I don't remember if it was for The Nation or what, by a reporter named Bob Dreyfus, about the fact, or the accusation at least, that uh, Ariel Sharon was having the exact same problem with the Mossad, and that, in fact, he created the Office of Special Plans inside his own office, first in Israel, and then that the Office of Special Plans in the Pentagon was a subsidiary or a, a branch off of that operation. Uh, yeah, there was, uh, there was an article in The Guardian about that, but there are uh, many other factors that sort of uh, point in, that, in those directions. First of all, there was a, uh, a study, that, or several studies that were done after the uh, initial invasion of Iraq, uh, in um, March of, uh, of 2003, um, a study, a couple of studies done in Israel. One of the principal ones was done by um, at this uh, sort of military think tank or strategic think tank at I think it's the University of Tel Aviv and um, uh, one of those universities over there. And the conclusion was that Israel had no better intelligence on. Uh, Iraqi weapons of mass destruction before the war than the United States did. They knew as little about it as the United States did. Yet, at the same time, the study concluded, and the study was done by a, a former uh, Israeli general, um, the hype that was coming out was very similar to the hype uh, that was coming out of the United States. The Israeli government was uh, hyping up the 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 uh, fact that there were all these weapons of mass destruction in the United States needed to do something about it. Ariel Sharon, in August of, uh, of uh, 2002, prior to the war, uh, his office was issuing press releases saying um, uh, that the United States shouldn't wait. The United States should uh, invade immediately. Um, and so there was all this pressure. At the same time, uh, there were many visits by Israeli uh, senior military Israeli um, um, uh, leaders, generals, and so forth, to the Pentagon to visit the uh, fight very secretly. And um, uh, so you have all these things taking place uh, prior to the war, and yet there was, there was, and there still is, very little investigation by the U.S. press into any connections between Israel and the United States in the, in the lead-up to the war. And then you have on top of that, as, I, as you mentioned, the, the report in the the Guardian, uh, indicating Ariel Sharon set up a, a, a similar little office of special plans to sort of cherry-pick intelligence. And that intelligence was uh, supposedly shared uh, or apparently shared with the United States. And if you hear some of the comments by uh, some of the senior uh, U.S. Uh, officials, uh, both intelligence and military and White House, uh, in the uh, in the past few months or the months uh, after the initial uh, invasion when they're trying to make excuses for why they can't find weapons of mass destruction. Numerous times they said uh, it wasn't only a mistake of the United States. Other intelligence agencies, without specifying any particular names, also had similar information, and uh, you know, the indications are that they're one of those countries, at least, was Israel. Oh, no, surely they're just referring to Great Britain. Uh, no, there, it's, it's plural, and uh, there's more than one country they're referring to, and the two countries we were getting the most intelligence from at the time were Britain and Israel. It's the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with James Bamford. He's the author of the book, A Pretext for War. Can I ask you about Saddam Hussein's peace deal? Do you know about that? Uh, His author, yeah. Richard Pearl? Right, yeah. I didn't uh, write a lot about that because there's been a... a a lot written about it uh, at the time, and I didn't have any original sources on it, so um, I didn't include much of it in, in the book. But I'm, I'm uh, vaguely familiar with that uh, peace uh, that uh, peace overture that was made. 
Now, the best way I understand it is that Saddam Hussein apparently didn't have any idea what this war was about any more than anybody else. And so basically he said, look, if this is about oil, I'll give you my mineral rights. If this is about Israel, we'll switch sides in the Palestinian and Israeli conflict. If this is about democracy, we'll hold elections in two years monitored by you and the French. If this is about weapons of mass destruction, which, yeah, right, but if it is, go ahead and send in thousands of FBI agents and army troops, and we'll let them look around wherever they want. That's basically the substance of his offer, right? Yeah, I, I, again, I, I was paying more attention to the intelligence aspect, so I, I specifically remember him saying, uh, you know, in terms of uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, uh, I think he referred actually to the CIA. He said, he said send as many CIA agents over as you want. And uh, uh, ironically, you know, uh, of all the countries in the world, we have more intelligence agents in Iraq at that moment than anywhere else on Earth. Um, and uh, they had full access to go everywhere they could go to look for whatever they wanted to look look for. And the U.S. had a list of uh, possible sites. And instead of having them go there and look at those sites, they pulled them out and we went to war. All right, it's the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton. The guest is James Bamford, the author of A Pretext for War. We'll be right back. Everybody, it's the weekend interview show. I'm your host Scott Horton, and on the phone is James Bamford. He's the author of an excellent book called A Pretext for War. Uh, Mr. Bamford, please forgive me if this sounds silly, but I've been watching the uh, cable news, and it seems like they're having this debate still about whether or not the Bush administration knew that they were lying when they said all of those ridiculous lies about Iraq's ties to Al Qaeda and their stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction. And, uh, for example, they hear Bill O'Reilly tell it. Well, they thought what they were saying was true, but it was based on bad information, and they didn't know that. Uh, what's your opinion of that? Well, actually, the CIA was giving them uh, the correct information for a long time, uh, that, that uh, there was no indication that there were uh, weapons of mass destruction. Um, uh, a perfect example of, uh, uh, of that was uh, when... Um, the president uh, wanted to indicate that Saddam Hussein was getting nuclear materials from Niger. Um, the CIA was telling the White House that there is no evidence that he was getting um, nuclear material, uh, uranium, from Niger. And uh, they, uh, George Tenet succeeded, the director of the CIA succeeded in getting them to delete it from the um, speech the president gave to the nation in Cincinnati, uh, but they insisted on putting it back in uh, for his State of the Union speech. Uh, and by then, George Tenet had sort of thrown up his hands and decided he was uh, uh, going to join the team as opposed to uh, fighting it. So um, um, there... And for uh, his trouble, he got all the blame. Exactly, and uh, the, the CIA... Um, so there's an example of the CIA telling the White House that no, there is no indication that he got this, and yet um, the president's saying the opposite to the nation. So I don't know how you define a lie, but uh, if you get your intelligence director saying that it's not true and you go ahead and you say it anyway, um, to me that sounds like a lie. Is America safer? No, I think America's far in, in far worse shape now than it's uh, ever been before in terms of uh, uh, the way it's uh, looked upon by the rest of the world and, and the way it's uh, vulnerable to, to terrorists. Now, you're not just some partisan Democrat, are you? No. I, 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 my writings, all the writings I've ever done, uh, have all been nonpartisan. I've written uh, three books on the intelligence community, and um, none of them have had a political slant at all. I, I don't take part in any political parties. I don't... Uh, support any particular group. I've never had anything to do with politics. So, um, uh, no, I'm, uh, my views are my views, but they're based on uh, on uh, uh, the way I view intelligence, not the way I view politics. Well, so if uh, whoever becomes president, uh, whichever uh, of the two wins, 
And if they decide to make you the chief of counterterrorism, uh, how would you recommend to them that the war on terrorism actually be fought as opposed to the way it's being fought now? Uh, well, first of all, I would uh, say that, number one, you've got to start changing the U.S. Uh, uh, foreign policy in the Middle East and uh, make it uh, uh, a rational policy based on, uh, um, you know, the way it would be um, um, acceptable around the world uh, uh, rather than just acceptable to certain uh, political interest groups. And um, that's number one. And number two, I would... Uh, uh, I think I'd have a far more rational policy to, to uh, defending the United States rather than squandering billions of dollars on building higher fences and um, just, uh, increasing the, uh, the hatred of the United States around the world. All right, everybody. James Bamford, he's the author of The Puzzle Palace, Body of Secrets, and his latest, A Pretext for War. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Mr. Bamford. Well, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's the Weekend Interview Show. We'll be right back.